Welcome to part two of A Scandal in Valdoria, where we will go over section three together. If you haven't seen the previous parts for this particular series, I'll put a playlist in the description for you to follow along if you want to. With that being said, let's get right into it. You stop by the Valdorian Times office and meet with some staff. After the meeting, one employee, Sonia or Sonia Gosi, comes up to you and says she may have something that can help with your investigation. What is Sonia's job role? That should be easy to find. So where equal equals Sonia Gosi. The role is a senior editor. Let's type that in, senior editor. Now, before I hit enter, just like what I did for Ronnie McLovin, I am going to put in some of my notes. The role senior editor 10.10.0.3. The email address is Sonia underscore Gosi, Valdorian Times dot news. And the host name is UL0M machine. Again, I like to write these comments just so I can reference it very quickly rather than rerunning my query. Let's go ahead and hit submit. That is correct. Sonia shows you a suspicious email she received a few weeks ago. What email address was used to send this email? The email address that was used was newspaper underscore jobs at gmail.com. Newspaper underscore jobs at gmail.com. Let's look for the email in our email logs. That is a great idea. When was the email sent to Sonia? Okay, so the recipient is going to be Sonia. Sonia underscore Gosi. And we can search for the sender, which is where sender equals newspaper underscore jobs at gmail.com. And this was sent at January 5th at 9.42.05 UTC time. What URL was included in the email? That is this one right here. Ooh, take a look at the document name, Valdorian Times Editorial Offer Letter. This could be something interesting. You asked Sonia if she clicked on the link, but she says she doesn't remember. <laughs> Let's help her remember. What is Sonia Gosi's IP address? Perfect, that is why we put this comment in. I can just simply copy and paste that here. Did Sonia click on the link? That's a great question. What kind of table should we take a look at if we wanted to see outbound events? Hmm, that would be this one right here. Outbound network events. I mean, passive DNS might work too, but let's use outbound network events. Outbound, perfect. And did Sonia click on the link? Where... I guess we'll be using the source IP. Source underscore IP equal equals, what is Sonia's IP? It is 10.10.0.3. And I am going to say where URL has, and I'll put in promotionrecruit.com. And look at that. We do have an event, meaning that Sonia did click on the link. If so, enter the timestamp. Okay. That is this one right here. Oh no, it looks like Sonia did click on the link. What was the name of the docx file in the link? Oh, that we saw earlier. Go ahead and paste that in and hit submit. If she clicked on the link, we should assume that the file might have been downloaded. Let's see if we can find the file on her machine. What is Sonia Gosi's host name? <laughs> Again, very important to put in our comments here. When did the download docx file first show up on Sonia's machine? What table name would that be? When did the downloaded docx file? Let's see, we have employees, authentication, file creation events was likely the one that we're looking for. Because if somebody were to download a document, that particular file would then be created onto disk. And I would imagine that the table name of file creation events would capture that. And what columns exist here? There's timestamp, host name, username. Okay, I guess we can use either or. So the host name or the username. But since it's specifying the machine itself, I am going to go with the host name. File creation events where host name equals, and let's copy in Sonia's host name. And for now, let's just go ahead and run this command or query, I should say. And since we do know the file name, which I'll go back to copy it again, which is this one right here, the docx file. 
I am going to include a filter where the file name, where file name equal equals, let's paste that in. Aha, perfect. So this document was first created on this particular host at 10.24.04 UTC on January 5th, 2024. Let's go back to the question, when, so I'm guessing they want the time. What was the full path of the docx file that was downloaded? The full path, this one. So this was downloaded onto the downloads folder. A hash is a string that uniquely represents the contents of a file. We can get a hash of a file by running it through a hashing algorithm. Lucky for us, the hashes of all downloaded files are already captured. And that is true, as we can see here, it's using the SHA-256 algorithm. What is the SHA-256 hash of the file that Sonia downloaded? I'll just go ahead and copy this and paste it in. After the malicious file was downloaded, it began executing malicious content. That's not good. Let's continue to look at Sonia's machine. What is the name of the file .ps1 that was written to disk immediately after the docx was downloaded? Interesting, so there was a .ps1 file. For those that don't know, a .ps1 file is a PowerShell script that is often abused by attackers. Taking a look here, it does say it began executing malicious content. And if I were to take a look at the available tables, the one of interest to me is the process events because that would contain activity for any processes that were executed. So I'll type that out here, process events. And I am going to say where, do they have the host name? Yes, host name and they have the username. I'll, I'll just filter it with host name for now. Where host name equal equals, and let's keep in mind of the timestamp of when the document was created. Again, it was at 1024 at January 5th. If we scroll down all the way to January 5th, let me just move this up a bit. It was at 1024. So let's follow the chain of events here. We have our Explorer and Explorer opened up Microsoft Word, which is what we see here under the process name. When Microsoft Word was executed, which I would assume was that document, the Valdorian underscore times document. And actually we can probably confirm that by clicking the process command line. And yeah, right here. So Microsoft Office Word opened up the Valdorian times editorial offer letter. When that opened up, Microsoft Word spawned another process which executed automatically called hacktivist underscore manifesto dot PS1. And again, PS1 is a PowerShell script. That is our answer to this. What is the name of the file? The name of the file is hacktivist. Actually, in case I typo anything, I'm just gonna copy this and paste that in. When was this new file created? I'll go back to my file creation events and replace this docx file with the hacktivist PowerShell script. This was created within seconds. So let's go ahead and copy that. The file extension of this new file.ps1 is pretty interesting. Let's do some research. What type of file is this? I did mention this previously. A .ps1 file is a PowerShell script. So I'll type in PowerShell. I wonder if they want script, but let's just try PowerShell for now. No, oh, perfect. Okay, that works. You managed to do some forensics and get a copy of the PowerShell script. Here's what it looks like. Let's see. We have the host UI foreground color and the foreground color is going to be green. It says with the comment, green is a hacker color. Okay. Define plink URL and destination path. Ooh. So plink is a popular tool that is used for what is called tunneling and is a common technique that, again, is used by attackers to establish that persistence. The destination path for plink is under c colon backslash program data backslash temp. I really love that. KC7 is showing you this because this is very common in real world scenarios. A lot of attackers do stage their tools in directories like this. So if you are a SOC analyst slash incident responder or a senior SOC analyst, it's always a good idea to query these directories to see if you can find any interesting or low hanging fruit. Continuing on, it says, let them know we're here. Write host, LOL, you're about to get pwned. Start sleep two seconds. 
and we do see an invoke web request. What this will do is tell PowerShell to go out or essentially get a domain that is listed under the variable of $plink URL, which if we take a look at the top, says $plink URL equals HTTPS, the earth.li, and plink.exe. So once this script executes, it will write to host saying, LOL, you're about to get pwned. And then it will go out and download the plink file going to this particular domain. Once it's finished downloading, it will output that file into the destination path of C colon backslash program data backslash temp backslash plink.exe. Once that is done, it will then write out the text. And then finally, it will run plink. And if you recall, I did mention that plink is a common technique used by attackers for tunneling. And that is essentially what this is doing right here, where it is using the username of shadow and the password of, what does that say? Truth will set you free. And an external IP address of 205.129.146.36. In this script alone, it has a ton of IOCs, AKA indicators of compromise that you can use to scope out your entire environment. That way you can identify other hosts that might be infected with the same script. For example, you can query the domain of the.earth.li, or you can look at the directory of program data temp, or you can look at the IP address of 205.129.146.36, and or you can search the file hash across your environment. A bunch of juicy information <laughs> within this script. So what does the attacker say to let you know they are here? That is the LOL, you're about to get pwned or spelled like that. According to the PowerShell script, what might be the hacker's favorite color? I believe that was green. Yeah, green as a hacker color. I'm typing green and level up. You reached level eight. The purpose of the script is to invoke blank and uncover the truth. Is to invoke blank. Is to invoke plink. Let's see if that's the answer here. Because it is downloading plink and then executing it. And I believe that might be the answer for this. Type in plink.exe. And that is incorrect. Maybe without the exe, just plink. Ah, there you go. <laughs> we might be able to find more information about the PowerShell script in process events data. Look at that. We're already in here. Look for the process events related to the PowerShell script. Use the name of the .ps1 file, which is hacktivist underscore manifesto, to find related process events. How many process events are there related to this PowerShell script on Sonia's machine? For this particular one here, for the process events, I am going to use the column name of process command line because this column will contain or should contain all of the events that are related to our PowerShell script. Let's type in where process underscore command line and I am going to say has and let's put in our hacktivist manifesto. Just like that. And let's see, we have one, two, and three events. Before I hit submit, let's take a look at what this does here. I'll expand that. So we know that the PowerShell executable script was executed, and then we see a scheduled task creation where it is running hourly every five hours with the task name of hacktivist manifesto. And it runs the following, oh, let's just double click that. And it runs the following powershell.exe where the execution policy is bypass and the file is the PowerShell script. Okay, nice. Let's click on submit. It looks like one of the processes is using scheduled task. And that is the one that we saw right here, which creates a scheduled task. Scheduled task can be used to conduct certain actions at a regular interval. What is the full command? And that we already know because we are looking right at it. What execution policy is set in the command? The execution policy is set to bypass. Check process events for evidence of plink.exe being executed. What IP address is used when plink is executed? We did see that in the script itself. But with the process events, we might be able to see that again. So 
I am going to change our hacktivist to plink. And looking at the command line, oh, it's different. We have a 136.130.190.181. This is another indicator of compromise that we can then search across our environment to check for scope. That's not good. It looks like an attacker has established a connection to Sonia's computer from an external IP address. What username did the attacker use when connecting via plink? The attacker used the username of shadow. What password did the attacker use when connecting? That is this one right here. I know this because it is invoking dash PW, which is short for password. Attackers use plink to establish a tunnel to a compromised machine. Now that the attackers have established a tunnel to Sonia's machine, they can manually run commands to do specific things on the device. This is called hands-on keyboard activity and something that you do not want to see in a real world scenario. Let's look closer at this machine to find commands that the attackers may have run after establishing the tunnel. What six letter command did the attackers run to figure out which user they are logged on as on the computer? Well, that's a pretty good question. Now, let's keep in mind of when plink was executed, which was on January 6th at 2.39.35 AM. I am going to continue to use the process events, but I am going to remove where process command line has plink. And instead, I'll just simply run where hostname equals Sonia's machine. And then we'll head over to January 6th, 2.39. This is when plink was executed. And about five hours later, we can see a command called who am I? This right here is a common command that administrators or even attackers use to do exactly this, figure out which user they are logged on as. And that is the answer. Nice. Who am I is called a discovery command. Attackers use commands like these to learn more about the computers they compromise. Why is my screen all glitchy? <laughs> I just noticed there's a long green line here. I'll just leave it as is. How many discovery commands did the attackers run on this machine? Let's see. There is who am I, which is one. IP config is another discovery command. You know what? As a fun exercise, let's run this. So if I were to type in who am I, it shows that I am logged in as Steven. If I type in IP config, I can see my IP address. If I type in ARP A, let's type in task list slash SVC. And then I can type in net space view. Now this is taking quite a bit of time, but you know what? Let's just Google net view. And here it says it displays a list of domains, computers, or resources that are being shared by the specified computer. And what that tells me is that all of these commands, whoops, all of these commands starting from who am I, IP config, up to net view are discovery commands. Because what this does is that it retrieves information about the environment. There is one, two, three, four, five commands that were ran. We've hit a dead end. You triage the rest of the logs for this machine and it looks like nothing else malicious happened here. Do you think we can safely stop our investigation? No, we must continue. Hopefully, you're starting to gain a bit more confidence in your ability to query logs using KQL. In the next video, we'll finish up the scandal in Valdoria. And if you are enjoying the series, let me know by hitting that like button and subscribe if you want to. Remember to stay curious and do things differently.